Hi, welcome to the next video. First, we talked about the diversity of life on Earth, and now we're going to talk about the evolution of life on Earth. We touched a little bit on this by thinking about those unicellular organisms, and now I am going to introduce you to the earliest four legged animals, the tetrapods. Um, they show up about 400 million years ago in the fossil record. The earliest mammals will come next, and they first appeared in the fossil record about 200 million years ago. Now, as you learned from the TED Talk I assigned for this module, we are basically an odd branch that evolved out of the fishes. This started about 400 million years ago, when a creature benefited from being able to locomote on the bottom of the ocean, more so than it did from swimming. And gradually, those fins evolved into legs, enabling a form of locomotion we are very familiar with today, walking on four legs. Animals with four legs are called tetrapods. We have footprints of tetrapods from about 400 million years ago, but we don't see the first bony fossils of these critters until about 700, meh, until about 375 million years ago. But once they show up on the scene, their ability to walk on four legs enabled them to move onto land and eventually into the air. From the earliest tetrapod arose lineages that led to the amphibians, dinosaurs, reptiles, birds, and of course, mammals. Ah, what an amazing evolutionary innovation those four legs were. So let's pause for a moment and appreciate it. And now, since we are mammals, let's move on. Mammals! <laughs> there are four major groups of mammals. There are the eutherians, the marsupials, monotremes, and the multituberculates. Now, the eutherians are the placental mammals, us, for example, and all other mammals that have internal gestation. The marsupial mammals shared a last common ancestor with the eutherians about 90 million years ago. And on many levels, they're pretty similar to eutherians. But think about like kangaroos. Very cute, but pretty different in that they give birth to their young. They give birth to young that have not completed their development. And that fetus, after it's born, it crawls up into a pouch and then suckles and develops inside the pouch instead of remaining in the uterus as the eutherians do. Marsupials are found in Australia and New Guinea, and there are also three Linnaean families that live in the Western Hemisphere, which includes the opossum. The monotremes are egg-laying mammals. There are two, the platypus in Australia and the echidna in New Guinea. These animals are warm-blooded, and they produce milk, but like a bird, they lay eggs, and they have a cloaca. A cloaca is a single opening for urination, defecation, and reproduction. And last but not least are the multituberculates, mammals only known from their fossilized remains. Although they are now extinct, the multituberculates were actually the most evolutionarily successful of the mammals to date. They existed from 140 million years ago until just 30 million years ago. So they were around for about 110 million years. Their fossils are found on the continents of Asia and North America, and they ranged in size from that of a tiny mouse to the size of a beaver today. But mammals appear in the fossil record even earlier than the multituberculates. The oldest known, geologically speaking, of course, the oldest known mammal is from the early Jurassic sediments in what is today China. These sediments were deposited about 195 million years ago. The scientists who found and described these fossils, they named them Hadracodium, and they were tiny. This picture, it shows a typical paperclip for scale, and a reconstruction of the animal shows that the animal's body is not much longer than that paperclip. These little mammals, they're generally considered to be more like proto-mammals, and it is thought that they survived in the cold and dark of night. 
What all of these mammalian groups have in common is that they are warm-blooded, the scientific term being homeothermic, and they also lactate. So after their babies are born, the babies are nourished with the milk derived from their mother's body for at least some period of time, and this greatly assists with their continued development. Oh, and that before being born time, they develop for a while inside their mother rather than in an egg outside of the mother's body, like snakes and birds do. Of course, the monodremes lay eggs, so you have some interesting overlapping characteristics there. And now, lastly, we need to think about teeth, what we call heterodonty. Mammalian teeth come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, even within the mouth of an individual. Okay, so run your tongue along your teeth and notice how they differ in size and shape depending on where they are. Now, the front of the mouth has teeth like spatulas, and the back of the mouth has teeth like little boxes with bumps all over the top. This type of dentition is referred to as being heterodont rather than homodont when the teeth are all the same size and shape. Paleontologists think that heterodonty opened up the ability for mammals to eat a wider variety of foods and for very specific specializations in diet to occur. Heterodonty gave mammals an evolutionary advantage that served them well. Ah, but there were some other things that likely really helped them too. Not the least of which is the bad fate that met the dinosaurs. Have you had a chance to listen to the Radio Lab podcast about this? Dino apocalypse. Oh, such a good listen. So be sure to do that as part of this module. Before we turn our focus to primates, I want to share with you what we think led to the demise of the multi-tuberculates. Now on the left here, you see surface scans of teeth from four different multi-tuberculates. Notice how much variation there is. Some of the teeth have a lot of little pointy structures, some look like fans, and some are really long, kind of like a loaf of bread with notches in it. Now on the right, you're going to see a photograph of a mouse's dentition. And this is a mouse who the species is alive today. This particular one is obviously skeletonized, so that one's dead, but <laughs> the species is around today. So rodents, like this mouse, they have very few teeth. Their front teeth grow continuously, which is great for gnawing. And they have a much more simple set of teeth in the back of their mouths. Paleontologists don't really know why, but once rodents that look like this one on the right, once they appear in the fossil record, those multi-tuberculates, they start to decline in frequency. Something about the ancestors of the rodents, like this mouse, gave the multi-tuberculates Oh, it gave them an advantage over the multi-tuberculates, and it brought about the end of 110 million years of evolution. The multi-tuberculates appear to have been brought down by a mouse. Now let's focus a little bit within the placental mammals. So within placental mammals, there are 23 Linnaean orders. The closest relatives to the primates among those 23 orders so the other major mammalian groups with which we share a more recent common ancestor back in evolutionary time might be a little surprising to you. It's the Chiroptera, Scandentia, and the Dermopterans. Let me introduce you. First, there are the bats, the Chiropterans. Bats represent an amazing diversity of genera and species that evolved the ability to fly like birds. But remember, birds aren't mammals. Now, even though bats seem so different from us because they fly, the way their organs function and how their immune systems work, it's fairly similar to ours, much more similar than our, say, horses compared to humans. And this similarity is why viruses like the one that causes COVID-19, why these viruses jump more easily from bats to humans than can viruses that infect horses. And then there are the tree shrews, the order Scandentia, and the Dermopterans, which includes colugos and flying lemurs that neither fly nor are they lemurs, 
but they do have these huge skin flaps that they use to glide from tree to tree. And when they aren't gliding through the air, <laughs> don't they look like stuffed animals wrapped in their own snuggly blanket? I love these little guys. There aren't many of them in the world, though. There is one genus and two species that both live in Southeast Asia. Now, the earliest primates, as we saw with the earliest mammals, the earliest primates don't really look much like what you might envision in your mind when you think of a primate. Some of my colleagues like to refer to the earliest primates as glorified rats, <laughs> but to the chagrin of my other colleagues who dedicate their lives to finding the fossilized remains of these glorified rats. I mean, early primates. To give you a sense of what these creatures looked like, here's a reconstruction made by an artist. We call these protoprimates the Plesiad depiforms, and one of the best known genera is Purgatorius. It definitely does have a rat-like look, but characteristics of the bony inner ear and its dentition align it with primates rather than mice. The Plesiad depiforms Ooh, they did very well in their time, back in the Paleocene, 65 to 56 million years ago. We see many different varieties of them across what is now Europe and North America, what has been referred to as an adaptive radiation. And there were a lot of them. In some of the fossil assemblages, 30% of the fossils you find are of these little critters. What the evolutionary journey um, looked like that took primates from the plesiodapiforms to the variety of primates alive today. You know, all the primates we see here in this collage, what was that like? Hmm, it's a fantastic one for sure. And the main through line revolves around the role that climate played. Time and time again, the primates were able to move into new lands as the climate warmed or cooled. Their diets had to adjust, and their social structures enabled a range of strategies for how to successfully rear the next generation. Now let me give you just a couple of examples of how climate played into this. So this graph here, it shows time on the y-axis from 65 million years ago up to the present day. Now on the x-axis, there are two different data sets plotted. One on the right, which is temperature, and one on the left. The left is the estimation of sea level relative to, relative to where it is at today. So when you see this line that's labeled present day, things to the left, so the data that are plotted to the left of that, that indicates that sea level was lower than it is today. And when it's plotted to the right, it indicates that sea level was higher than today. Okay, so then further over on the right where it says temperature, we have temperature plotted. So both sea level and temperature, you can see they changed a lot over evolutionary time. Now, focus your eyes on the end of the Paleocene down towards the bottom of the graph. Notice that there is an upward blip in temperature, indicating the hottest episode we know of for the Earth. This is called the Paleo-Eocene Thermal Maximum. Over about 500,000 years, or a little less, the Earth's temperature spiked by several degrees Celsius, leading to an expansion of tropical forests. This was so dramatic that the tropics extended up to about the Arctic Circle. Woo, this was quite an amazing time for primates, as they were able to follow those tropical rainforests all around the world distributing primates widely across the northern uh, widely across the continents in the northern hemisphere this set the stage for quite a range of adaptive strategies to unfold over the eocene and beyond now i also want to draw your attention to the middle of the miocene do you see this drop in temperature here it is followed by continued cooling ever since and then the cyclic ice ages by the time you get into the pliocene this drop in temperature in the mid-Miocene, ooh, a really big thing happened around then. The Mediterranean Sea dried up completely. No water, nothing, just a vast salt flat. This loss of water had a dramatic influence on the weather patterns in Africa and across Eurasia. Ooh, things got much drier. Forests receded, and there were major shift, shifts in which plants and animals 
were more common. This climatic event, about 15 million years ago, it's a pretty essential part of the events that ultimately resulted in the evolution of humans. Remember how we talked about the tyranny of the present earlier in, actually, the video right before this, <laughs> earlier in the semester? <laughs> Let's put th this into practice now. Now consider primates today in Africa and Asia. There are lots and lots of monkeys around, many different species, ooh, and lots of them. Now there aren't very many apes. You're likely quite aware of how endangered the apes are. These are the, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, orangutans. Now, there are very few of them in terms of number of species, number of individuals, and in terms of the geographic ranges they live in, but it hasn't always been like this. This figure, it shows time on the x-axis, 30 million years ago on the left, over to today on the right. I've plotted a representation of biological diversity in black, this is the number of different species for both plant, um, for both apes and monkeys. Now you'll notice that there were a lot of apes in the past, right up until about 8 million years ago, when they started to significantly decline in number. Today, there are only about 23 different species of ape. Monkeys have essentially the opposite pattern. They are really rare in the fossil record until about 8 million years ago. And their biodiversity increases dramatically at the end of the Miocene that's shown here in light orange. And today, there are about 120 different species of monkey. The primate world, it really was different 8 million years ago. In the midst of this shift around 8 million years ago, our lineage has its origins. Humans and chimpanzees last shared a common ancestor between seven and eight million years ago. This is the group of organisms we call the hominids, all of the creatures that lived on our side since that last common ancestor with chimpanzees. Now that dramatic shift in the middle of the Miocene when the Mediterranean dried up resulted in significant evolutionary shifts. And among all that shifting, the human lineage began, and that is a topic for another video. So thank you for joining me on this whirlwind tour of evolution, from the formation of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago up to 7 million years ago. The journey from there to the earliest humans comes next, and so I will see you in the next video. Bye.